brother, hey brother, hey sister, hey sister, hey sibling, how are you? Hey, how you been doing? Hey, what's up? This is your girl Diamond. How are (laughs) y'all? So I have a special guest for the show that I have been following for, I think, since 2015. I think that I was what it was. <laughs> so, I think it was 2015. And her story was so moving to me, so amazing. And I always wanted to have her on here to share y'all with y'all her experience. So I have Raji Narin Singh. You got it, girl. You got it. Yeah, listen, some people say Narain, some people say Naren, but as long as you said it, I'm happy. (laughs) I love it. I I think it's really, that's an interesting name because you are of Indian and Trinidadian uh, heritage. My father was um, uh, from, he was from the country of Trinidad and Tobago, but he was of South Asian Indian descent. Right. It was a big influx after slavery. Um, right. There were there were 150,000 East, uh, I should say, Asian Indians that went to Trinidad to work the sugarcane fields because after slavery there was no one to work the fields, and so um, they were given a contract, a five year contract, as like indentured servants, and so. After five years, they had a choice. They either got a passage back to India or they got a piece of land. So most of them stayed in Trinidad and they, they took the land. So that's my wow. father's side. Yeah. That's yeah, some so history it, I did not know. And oh, I, yeah, need to, yeah. a lot of people, I need to look into that. That's it. interesting. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that history. Um, and so, yeah, so you're right. I am half Indian, but my mom is American and my mom is a mix. You know, I, I sometimes I call it like a Creole mix, you know, of like um, uh, African-American, French, Polynesian, and Native American. So, mm. so, so she's a mutt and I'm more of a mutt. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> so, so actually you were born in Brooklyn, and, but raised in Philadelphia. You, you know what, girl, you have researched. Oh my God. Yes, yes. I was born in Brooklyn and I grew up in Philly. Tell me about your family. Tell me about growing up. Who was loving on you? Who was making you feel special? Who was feeding you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age. And um, I would say, like, at that time, I couldn't label how I was really feeling or what it, what it was that I was feeling. But I just knew that I felt different. And from about the age of four, that's when they were, the name calling started, like faggot and sissy, the kids were calling me. And I didn't know what the name meant, but I know I didn't like the way it made me feel, you know, the name made me feel. So um, I, my family unit was loving in the sense of my father, he was a provider, you know, he took care of us. We lived in a pretty nice neighborhood because when I was four years old, we moved out of the apartment. My sister was a baby. And, you know, my parents were like a young couple struggling and trying to make it. And so then we moved up to Mount Airy, Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia, which is considered like the one of the, well, now it depends on what area of it. But back then when I was growing up, it was considered like the bougie part of town, you know, one of the nicer areas. My father, he was a provider, but, you know, God bless his soul, he was also an alcoholic. So I dealt with that dynamic growing up. And, um, you know, it's almost like one minute it's good and the next minute, like, it's chaos, you know? So, like, you're walking on eggshells, you know? Um, Now, my mom was always the epitome of mother. Like, you know up at five in the morning, getting us up for school, made us breakfast. You know, we always had like, you know, our lunch to take. Dinner was, you know, we always sat down for dinner, uh, very supportive. But, you know, within the dysfunction, like, because my, I would say that it was a dysfunctional unit because of 
my dad's um, addiction. And so because of that, I think my mom, myself and my sister, we were like in a dysfunctional situation and, you know, we were surviving a lot of the time, you know, and, and so, um, but I, I never felt like my mom didn't have my back. Like I always felt like she's been in my corner. As I got into school, the bullying became relentless because uh, not only was I multiracial, so I didn't look like a lot of the other kids at school. Um, I stood out that way, but I was an effeminate little boy. I wasn't acting like the other boys. So I had like the double whammy going. And, um, you know, it was not only name calling, it was beat downs and, you know, really, really rough. And I knew I couldn't really go home and express what I was going through because, you know, from a young age, we get that being gay or trans isn't really an accepted thing. And so you're scared to go and tell your family because, you know, you don't want to get it there either. And I knew I couldn't do that. So and it was just one of those things where, you know, I kind of dealt with it, a lot of it with, on my own, like not really going home and pouring out to my parents what was going on. Of course, there were some times where my mom had to end up going to the, up to the school because I got into a fight or whatever. But, you know, I never would say it was because they were calling me gay or, you know, faggot or sissy. I wouldn't say that. I really relate to the, the notion of how your father's addiction kind of shifted the dynamic in the, in, in, in the, this, the functionality of the other members of your family. My mother um, was an addict. And um, one of the things I always, you know, kind of give my grandmother a bad rap because she was the only one in my family that kind of wasn't fucking with the trans thing. She was the one that kind of didn't accept it. And she always like, oh, you're going to always be my grandson. Not even you're going to always be my grandson. Very like you're going to always be a, a boy to me. So I don't know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Always that kind of yeah. shit. And yeah. so but. Now, that kind of came later e before because, you know, early, earlier when my mom was going through like the worst parts of her addiction, the stress that my grandmother was under when as far as keeping her daughter, you know, away from drugs or trying to keep her away from drugs or trying to get her off of drugs, trying to get her to go to rehab on top of taking care of um, us as as yeah. her grandchildren like she yeah. literally came to boston and because a woman a older a older woman where we were at in the in the in boston when we lived there we lived in this three story um apartment and the 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 girl who lived under us had kids too but they all everybody in the fucking building was on drugs and so oh. the mother of her contacted my mother's mother <laughs> and she was like, my daughter is out here running the streets and your daughter is out here running the streets and you need to come up here. Your, your, your grandbabies gave me your number and you need yeah. to come up here and see what the fuck is going on because I know this is not how you raised her to be. So you need to come to Boston. And my grandmother was all, all, all the way in Indianapolis where we're from and she came Ooh. to Boston and kind of saved us and kind of mm -hmm. came and got us. And so there, it was a stress. She was in a stressful relationship with my granddad then the stress of my mom, then the stress of us. And then not saying that me being queer was a, a, a stress, but it's something that she was against. So that was also a stress for her having to deal with me in her home. And so, yes, there was a, there was a particular dysfunction that my mother's addiction really brought and, and really um, weighed heavy on our relationship. That doesn't absolve her from her, her homophobia and transphobia, but it does. It, it I am conscious of how that relationship really changed the dynamic of our, you know, our, our function. So I, I totally understand that. And girl, let's face it. You know, I think that LGBTQ people, especially trans and gay, we go grow up with a lot of shame. And, and, and so it is a stressful thing because when you're getting messages that what you are, what you feel is wrong and you're getting it from family, you're getting it from 
your your community, you're getting it from the world, you know, you start to feel like, oh my God, like, you know, ashamed of it. At least I did. And and you know, even though it was like a shame that was kind of subconscious because I didn't it was just hard to connect all the dots at that age. Um, I just knew that I felt very different from the other kids and they were treating me as such. You know, they were like, it's like kind of like the pariah or the, um, you know, the outcast type thing. And so um, that was just really difficult as a kid to deal with because, you know, we all want to feel like we belong and we fit in. And so um, thankfully I was able to get out of the neighborhood school because I went up to sixth grade and it was like pure terror. My mom was able to, there was like a magnet school. I don't know where you're from, if they had magnet schools, but they were like special schools to get kids out of their neighborhood and mixed with like other kids from all around the city. So So you're um, talking about the Franklin Learning Center. Honey, listen, okay, Miss Interviewer, you did your research. So I'm talking about the Franklin Learning Center, which was the high school that I went to, which was also, it still is a magnet school. A and performance before, arts magnet school. In our city, yeah. our city, our city, our performance arts magnet school was Bra Ripple. And oh. we, you could get out of your neighborhood and go to this specific school for this particular um, pointed kind of curriculum. Yeah, so it got me out of my neighborhood school and it got me into more a school with more of a melting pot because there were kids from all over the city, all different types of ethnicities and races and, you know, mixtures and stuff. So it got a little better for me. Um, I always joke and say I became, instead of the scorn faggot, I became the popular faggot because... <laughs> And other, because, because really, I mean, I was getting involved in all different like, you know, activities, especially in high school, the choir and the student government. And, you know, um, the, I volunteered at the Red Cross and the United Way. And I was just a really active and popular kid. I even danced on Dance Party USA. I was a regular um, on that show. So, you know, I was popular, but the whisper was still, oh, yeah, but you know you know, he's a faggot or he's gay, you know, that kind of thing. So the stigma was still kind of there, you know? So tell me how and when you started to become, you know, you, you started to live your truth as a woman. That is something that I think I have like continued to grow in organically. Um, because I say from like the beginning, I was kind of put in like a gender war I think when you don't quite fit in the binary and you're someone that's like in the middle, whether you're trans or gender non-conforming or non-binary, whatever you classify yourself as gay and an, an effeminate gay guy, um, it's, it's difficult. And I think everyone has their story of strife and struggle. Um, so it was a lot of that, but I would say that I started to initially connect the dots of me being possibly trans, because for the longest, I thought I was just an effeminate gay guy. I thought I was just a, a queen, you know, like a, a, not even a butch queen, more like a, you know, a femme queen. A queen the, queen, baby. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, still like a, a, a gay man or a homosexual man, because, you know, we didn't have Google back then. So you couldn't, the information wasn't, as easily accessed. So when I started going out to the gay club, that was the first time I started seeing trans women. And I was like, wow. I was actually, to be honest, I'm just going to keep it real. I was a little scared of that. That's, I, that's, not, that's what's crazy. That's not the first time I've heard that from multiple people when they first meet trans people, they're, they're, they're scared. And I'm always like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think it was? I think in a way I was seeing aspects of myself and them that I wasn't ready to confront. 
And that was probably the scary thing. I was never nasty to them. Like when I was, cause I started going out to the club like when I got out of high school. So I was like 18, 19, 20. And I remember this one trans woman. I don't even know if she's still here. God bless her. She was the sweetest thing. So kind. You and her name? So, uh, do I remember her name? No, I don't. And I'm going to tell you when I would see her out and about at the clubs. This was in Philly. And one day I was downtown Center City, Philly, and I was walking and she was on the sidewalk selling flowers. And I'm Marsha P. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, about yeah, you it was to another, skip around it, with flowers and stuff. It was the Philadelphia version, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, it was a Korean flower shop. And the Korean owner, it was a gentleman, he was standing outside and she was like standing with the flowers. And, you know, now I know this was a person that gave her an opportunity to work. You know, because honey, you know how it is the whole uh, uh, employment situation for trans people, especially back then. But, you know, so I'm walking, she sees me and she's like, hi. And, you know, I was, my heart was beating and I was nervous and scared. But I, I remember distinctly smiling back at her and being friendly. So that's one thing I'm happy about that I didn't, I wasn't like nasty or, unkind it was just that internally I was going through all kind of stuff you know and um so you know I came down to South Florida uh when I was 21 and I left home because you know my dad and I were like oh button heads I was getting more you know coming out more and uh honey someone had to leave that house and it was his house <laughs> so the person that was leaving was me. And I, I knew, I, you know, now I know that I had to go. Like at the time, I didn't want to leave my mom and my sister, but I had, it was my time to leave. I had to go in order to like grow and evolve and become the person that I am today. So I came down to South Florida and- um, why, did again, you pick, why did you pick Miami? Well, you know, interestingly enough, it was between St. Louis, Missouri, or Miami. And the reason why is I had I have a good friend. We're still friends today, but she was living in St. Louis. And she said to me, well, you know, you can come and stay with me if you need to until you can get on your feet. What's her name? Um, Cecilia Wilson. Mm. Cecilia R. Wilson. And we're still friends to this day. Um, but my mom said to me, she said, why are you going to St. Louis when you know you complained about winter all through growing up? She says, you have an aunt in Miami that you can go to. And I feel more comfortable go you going to, you know, Miami to your auntie instead of like, you know, because Cecilia is a good friend, but still, you know, it was more like, I think uh, the whole thing of like being comfortable because it's family and I'm going to family. And so it made sense to me. And I was thinking, you know, growing up, we used to come down uh, to South Florida and visit on vacation. And I always liked it. So I was like, I'm not going to St. Louis. I'll be leaving, leaving a, a coal city to go to another coal city because I left home in January and um, it was January, the beginning of January and it was winter, you know? So anyway, that's how come I ended up down here. Yeah. Okay. So when you moved down there, of course it was a budgeting queer community. So how, how did you find family and community down there? So listen, any of my family members that tell me that they didn't know... <laughs> I was gay or trans or whatever. <laughs> they must have been blind and deaf, okay? Because, <laughs> <laughs> and then the reality is they just don't want to admit it, you know? But uh, when I came here, I got away from my dad and like we were button heads so bad at the time. But then I ended up in another home with a set of family that, you know, 
I hadn't addressed anything about me being gay. And so I still felt like I had to kind of keep it a secret as much as I could possibly keep it a secret. Um, so yeah, I started like, I, I tried to find work. Um, I enrolled in uh, Miami Dade Community College. I was trying to do positive stuff. Uh, and then also tipping out into the, to the um, LGBTQ uh, dating scene, like going to the clubs and stuff. I remember there were clubs back then, like there was this one club, club called Sugars and Honey, that, it was a little shack, okay, of a club. And when I tell you that club would get packed and the parking lot would be packed and people would just be partying. And, you know, in those days, I, you know, I was out like two, three times a week at the club. What year was this? <laughs> it was 89. Oh, 89 worked. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, girl, you making me really feel old now. <laughs> no, no, no. It was 89, 90. Okay. It was so, so, you know, back then people went to the club to get their life. See, now we have the internet. So people can stay home and kind of get their life if they want. But back then it was like, if you wanted to like have a sense of community and be around people like yourself, you had to get to a club, Thanks. you know? And, and so, and I always joke too, how the clubs were inconspicuous back then because, um, you know, like even in Philly, there'd be like a club one on a side street with like a door and like a number on it and you walk in the club and it opens up to this like you know all these lights and and, and fabulousness but to, to walk past the door you never know what was going on but I know that was for safety too because you know the the whole thing about being a, a gay club and things so anyway I got into the um nightlife scene down here and I started meeting people and again seeing trans women I had a few gay relationships, but the thing is, I could never understand why they didn't seem to mesh. Like they were always trying to butch me up, the guys, and it just didn't feel like, like, it, like it came together. It was always the straight boys in the neighborhood that were flirting with me. And you know, the, the straight boys that I see, you know, going to the supermarket and out and about, and so I know then they were basically seeing the woman in me, like it hadn't come out physically yet. But, you know, I say physical is one part. It starts inside of us. So, you know, it's an essence. It's the way you walk. It's the way you talk. It's the way you, you gesture and all of that. So they were seeing all of that. And I guess they were, at, you know, reacting to it. So I started connecting the dots. I was like, okay, wait a minute, like, maybe I am trans um, because I remember when I was a kid, the basketball I had, um, I would go in my room and I would um, put it up under my t-shirt and I would walk around like I was pregnant and then I'd have the baby and like I'd be, you know, like taking care of the baby, like a good mother and GI Joe, he was never going to war. He was always coming home to me and I was, his, in my mind, I was his wife. And then when I got in my teens and, you know, the hormones started to rage, always whenever I fantasized, I pictured myself with breasts and a vagina. But the thing is, I didn't even realize I was doing it. It was just so second nature. So here I am in my like early 20s and I'm starting to connect the dots. And so I didn't jump into like trans womanhood right away. I was, I was doing gender non-conforming and non-binary back in, you know, the, the, the 90s when, you know, before there was a movement and, you know, that's when people were throwing bottles and that kind of thing. But I had to live that for a while because it was like kind of like the bridge from me going from man, quote unquote, or male to trans woman. So I back then we called it androgyny. I don't know if you remember that word, but androgyny. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so I um now, now you, you, know, play, I started, now, hold on. you playing me like I'm a young girl out in these streets. So you ain't gonna play me like I'm a young girl. 
I, 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 I transitioned in 95, child. I, okay. Okay. My listen, tra- listen. Our transition is about the same age. We may be yeah. different in age in, in regards to years, right. but we transitioned right. around the same time, child. And you know what? It's funny. It's funny because I did think you were um, a, like a bit younger, but then when I, after being on with you, when we had the opportunity to be on the panel last month, I, the way you were talking, I said, oh, this is an older girl. Like, this yes, is a God, girl that, honey, I'm yeah. a grown woman out here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I got, I totally got that. When you were talking about your experience, I was like, oh yeah, she's been around the block. And you can relate to a lot of what I'm saying. Yeah. Like with the whole, you know, the way we grew up and that yeah. sort of thing. I remember so. going into my first gay club and exactly how you describe it. Everything looks simple when you first go when you're on the outside. And then when you go in, it is all these lasers and lights. And at that time, <laughs> people can smoke. So the smoke is kind of creeping around the room like a sexy snake. <laughs> and the and the lights are going through the through the smoke and everybody spinning and yeah, it's just oh my god it just was a uh, wonderful it was like walking into us <laughs> it's sure you know what that's a perfect description because i remember my first gay like gay club i walked in and i was like i couldn't believe it i just kept looking around like in disbelief because i'm like oh my god we can be free to be what we are and who and you know dance with who we want to dance with and you know and all of that yeah and then what's crazy for me is I had to so I was young I was I was raised in like this um falsetto kind of um Christian culturally let's just say culturally Christian home and you know it was always the 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 connotation that everybody gave the gay community was that it was It was this, they're going to tempt you. There's going to be this tempting thing. And even when I walked into the gay club and and when I would go home and that kind of guilt, I don't want to say guilt, but that kind of, that, that kind of training would come back to me and make me think that, Oh, of course, the gay club is gonna look all pretty and um and and you know with all the lights and totally yeah. different than the outside world because that is how quote and this is just my my Christian upbringing trying to creep into my psyche, um because that is how the devil yeah. <laughs> tempts you. He's gonna he's gonna make it all gold and sparkly and da 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 da. da. But then when I got older, I'm like, yo. This is I, I've seen um um uh, like heterosexual based clubs, and if they got some money behind them, it, you can yeah. go into that club and it looks glamorous like Studio yeah. Fifty Four, and yeah. but they don't they don't have that kind of that connotation. Well, some in in some contexts it does, depending on how you was growing up, yeah. but they don't have that connotation that it that is um that it is it is your this is what you are falling into the trap. And you are, oh, you are, yeah. are you getting caught up into this thing? It's, it's demonic and it's, yeah. you know, it's of the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally, those messages that we get. And again, it, 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 I think that it plays on our self-esteem a lot of times because, you know, I um, have a family member. I'm not going to put him, put the name out. Boy, do I want to, but I'm, I'm, I would just, I would just keep, keep it anonymous with that. But, um, you know, he keeps saying to me, oh, you know, you need to be humble. You need to be, um, you know, you need to um, humble yourself. And, and I said to him, I said, wait a minute, I'm one of the most humble people you will meet. But if you think I'm going to walk with my head down in shame because of what I am and who I am, you got another thing coming, buddy. Okay. Because that that's the thing. I think he can't take the fact that like I walk with self-esteem and I don't, I hold my head up and I'm not sh- like shuddering in shame. Like when I was that kid and they were calling me faggot and sissy and beating me up, you know? So I refuse. I said, you know, there's a difference. You can, the reason why the LGBTQ community has pride festivals every year is because of exactly that. 
We were beat down so much and our self-esteem was stripped away from us that of course we have to like promote and motivate our pride so that we can have self-esteem. But there's a difference between being confident or cocky. Okay, you know what I mean? Like you can have pride and self-esteem. That doesn't mean you're not humble. You know, so anyway, you know, yeah. people try to like camouflage things and like give you messages when it's really rooted in something else. You know? Something that somebody else thought they asked. Tell me about how long that time period of a bridge lasted between, you know, you going from you transitioning. How long did that time period last? Okay. So, yeah, I would say it was probably about a three-year time frame where I did, like, the androgyny thing. Um, I wore, like, real unisex clothing. Um, I grew my natural hair out. I had it pulled back, like, in a little ponytail or bun, and I was wearing a little makeup. And so very, very like unisex looking or, or um, gender bender type. And I remember people saying, you know, what the fuck is that? And you know, the, that kind of comment or those type of comments. But yeah, it was about a three year process or, or time frame, And then it started to not be enough. It wasn't enough. I was trying to find myself. And I thought, oh, you know, this gender non-conforming, non-binary, this is it. But then then after a while, it wasn't, it just wasn't it. I I I, and and I I started to want more and I I felt like I wanted to be more of a woman, you know, on the physical. And so that's when I and that was like in my late 20s. Um, when I started uh, to do that, like around 27, 28, um, with the hormones, the black market home hormones that I got on the street, I started taking, we, I even did the birth control thing. Remember? remember? <laughs> yeah. Honey, honey, <laughs> back then we were rubbing two nickels trying to live our truth and grasp it at anything Facts. to bring her out you, know? Facts. you would you would meet you uh, uh i know i would i met like a sister and a girl who was on birth control that one didn't wasn't taking them like that and honey she'll give them right to me yeah <laughs> so i started doing that and you know little by little my i call them my little 13 year old boobies started to come out you know where when when the nipple bust out you know and uh-huh. I felt so, honey, I felt so proud. We used to, I we used to call it your core. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you, I would wear tops that would try, like show it more, you know? And, um, and, and this is a funny story. I was working at a place at the time and I didn't feel like I was big enough for a bra yet. And I was wearing these tops and stuff. So one day I went into work and the director called me in her office and she closed the door and she sat down and she says, bitch, if we have to wear bras, your ass has to wear a bra. I was like, really? I need one. She's like, you need one. You, I was like, I didn't think I needed it. She said, tomorrow before you come to work, I want you to go to the store and get some training bras, you know. And but you know it's it's trial and error. It's just like even with the bathroom thing, I was still using the men's room up till a certain point because I didn't feel like I was, I guess, woman enough to be in the ladies' room. But the day came where I was at the sink washing my hands. A guy walks in and he jumps back out like, "Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am." Cause he thought he was in the wrong room. And then he's looking at the door and it's saying male and he's looking at me. And that was the moment I said, oh no, girl, you need to take your ass to the ladies room now. Yeah. Right, you getting through, honey. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Do you remember the time that you first was like, okay, here I am, Raji is here. I'm sorry, girl. It's just that 
I think for so long, I was trying to really like come into myself, <laughs> come into, you know, to, to my own and come into myself. And um, I had moments of that, but then something would happen. Someone would say something or, you know, I, I'd have, I'd have a beat down or, you know, some verbal attack and then it would rattle me and I just, just not feeling stable and not feeling like confident in myself. Um, I will say like after the hormones and I like, I would go out and I would see a lot of the other trans women and they looked so beautiful. They had like the, the voluptuous shapes and, and like the feminized face. And I was like, what are they doing? Because I, like I was on hormones, but I felt like it just, I wasn't like giving that. And you know, it, it's kind of like a bit of a peer pressure in a way, because, you know, you see the other girls looking so fab and like, you're like, well, wait a minute, what do I need to do um, to look like this? And um, it was also to the um, the safety issue because the less you could look like a, a man in a dress, the easier you could press through society because even if they knew you're trans, it's like you still gave, you were still giving like this woman, like this you know voluptuous, um, beautiful woman. So it just made it easier. So I think that's what took me down the road of black market injection um, because I saw the other girls getting it and they look so great. And then also the safety issue of um, not looking like, no offense to men in dresses. I mean, but at that time it was like a thing. If, you know, the less you could look like a man in a dress and more like a woman, um, you know, you would, you'd be able to press through society a little easier. Yeah, it's a, so, it's, a, it's a level of blending makes it a level, le gives you a level of safety. But also, even like you said, even if they know you're trans, you, what I learned is that when you get to a certain level that people can, people start almost respecting your womanhood. Like they almost like, oh, you are serious about it. You are not playing with it. You really look great. Girl. And so I might treat you, now this is not every single person, but some people will treat you better or a little, you get what I'm saying, or, or let you make it if you are doing it right. There's many times I've walked past a group of dudes that knew I was trans in my younger years, particularly my late teens, and they were like, yeah, but that motherfucker's doing it right. And, and it would, it would, you know, they'll say something. They, it might not be as that nice, but they might say something like, oh, that motherfucker doing it better than half the females out here. That's my yes. job business, shit like that. Yes. And so um, it will lead to, you know, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes they still be assholes, but sometimes they would treat you a little bit better. A little you better. A little you hit it on the head. I remember I had ran into this woman that I had used to work with. And by then I had already started getting pumped. And she came up to me and she said, okay, now I got respect for you. She said, now I respect you, you, cause you're taking it serious. Look at you. And, and that's how she greeted me. You know, people don't realize you taking this very serious pretty much from the beginning, but you're trying to find your way. But you know, they, you're right. And you hit it on the head with that. I was also um, working at a place Oh my God, they put me through hell there. And there was this guy that hated my guts. He could not stand me. And he would talk so much shit about me. And one day we ended up in the elevator together. And when the elevator doors opened, he could not, he was like doing like this, like, and it, he could not walk out first. He had to let me go. And you know what? When I walked at the elevator, I said, yeah, you might hate my guts, but you got to respect me as a fucking woman. Because you, you know, because he couldn't bring himself to walking out the elevator first, even though he couldn't stand me. <laughs> 
so yeah, I remember the first time I got my face pumped and I went and looked in the mirror and it was like, because you know, when you get pumped, it's instant results. Like you see stuff right away. And I walked into the bathroom and looked in the mirror and I was like, oh, yes, I'm getting it. She's coming out. I was, and that's that's a moment that I that's a moment that I had where it was like, wow, like she's uh, Miss Raji is coming out now. <laughs> yes, I had that experience when I was like nineteen. It was the first time that I had got pumped, and I coincidentally both of the people who um, I don't know who all you got pumped by, but. Um, both of our people got went to prison because of their um them pumping oh, wow. people and killing them um wow. and in in that situation when i was 19 all the bad stuff for her that i knew of hadn't happened yet there were some people that she had pumped and deformed but i of course she, nobody is letting me know who they are yeah. because you know that the person who's bringing me to her is trying to get get a yeah, cut of the money they're, they're selling it yeah they're, right they're selling it she's the best she's this you know she she got the medical grade silicone they are selling this as if this person knows what they're doing what they're putting you in you is legit and as a 19 year old i'm not i'm not absolving myself from the choice but I was gullible enough. I was vulnerable enough as a trans woman who was poor, who was just trying to be pretty, who was just trying to, um, you know, do what I needed to do that I that I seen other girls doing. And and this, like you said, it is a certain level of peer pressure. But it, but it's also it's just a combination of peer pressure. It's combination of. Um, Gender dysphoria is combination yeah. of look. I'm just trying to be a bad bitch, and anybody can relate to that. There, to, yeah. whether you you wearing lashes or makeup for the first time, you you're putting the little um. If you are a cisgender woman and you're putting the little um the little cutlass in your bra, making your boobs look a little bigger because they look better in the top that you bought that you wanted to look good. Whatever you do that makes you feel prettier buffer whatever makes you look good to yourself whatever gives you confidence all that feeling yes i know that going if you're listening to this i know that you might not understand it going to this extreme but it didn't feel like an ex extreme thing in the moment it felt like other people were doing it i'm seeing great results in other people of course the naivete is Oh, that won't happen to me. Cause at that time I didn't know anybody that had like died from it or, you know, yeah. even got disfigured from it. People the in my life, they me. were looking pretty. Yeah, the same with me. The same and with so me. I did so when I did it, it was, oh, oh, that's not gonna happen to me. I'm going to somebody reputable. I'm there's people who are telling me they went to her, they did, and and that she has legit stuff. They are here, they're looking good, blah, 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 blah. So I felt like she was going to do me really, really well. And, you know, this is kind of where, these are one of the moments in my younger years where the, the, the colorism, the benefits of colorism, quote unquote, started was a unique situation in my life because when she done, when she was about to do me, about to pump me, she said, oh, I'm about to wear you out. I'm about to make you my most beautiful girl because you're going to be like a walking billboard. You light skin, you pretty, you red. Well, she called me red because in the South, red, they yeah. call you red bone. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, you red, <laughs> you, you, you pretty. Everybody's going to see you and you go to Jackson State. I was the first trans woman to go to Jackson State. So I was quite popular in the city. And so wow. she was like, you're going to be a walking billboard for my work. So she was very meticulous about making sure my face was perfect, making sure that it was exactly right. Just, just She just was so into trying to make it look good. And how she was selling it, I was like, oh, let's do it. Luckily for me, I didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I didn't, I didn't, couldn't just keep going back to her. But the first time she did me, 
It was just so nice. I looked in the mirror and was like, oh my God, my cheekbones are sitting right. Everything is looking right. Um, people saw it and was like, um, I had told them that I had an allergic reaction to something because you know, at first you swell up, <laughs> but I told them I had an allergic reaction to something. <laughs> and, then, and then I said, yeah, the swelling will go down. Um, you know, I just, I ate some fucking peanuts. Something I said. And the swelling went down, but you know, it don't go all the way down. All the way down. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was looking so pretty, so nice, so sickening. And I loved it. I loved the experience. So I was like, oh, when I get some more money, I'm going back. And yeah. You know, the thing about black market injection, it really is a roll of the dice because there are girls that get it done and they have fabulous results and they end up being fine. But then there's girls like me who kind of, it was a mixed bag. Like my face went haywire and, you know, became very disfigured. But then the, my body for the most part has been pretty stable. And then we have girls that got it done and they died from it. So it really is like a mixed bag, a roll of the dice. And, you know, the crazy thing with this is you can have it done and like 25 years later, your body starts to react to it. I have a girlfriend, she had her pumping about 27 years ago. And recently she started having some issues with her body rejecting it. So it's just one of those things, um, you know, but a lot of us, we didn't have the resources. You know, it wasn't, and, and not only money, but like, you know, people Connection. being like, yeah, connection, uh, the, the connection, um, the medical community being receptive to us. I mean, there were so many different things that we dealt with. And so, you know, we were just, we were, like I said, rubbing two nickels together to live our authentic truth. And, you know, I always say this, it's one of my, my um, expressions, honey, we trans women and trans people as a whole, but especially we trans women, we can take lemons and make lemon meringue pie, honey. Not lemonade. We make a lemon meringue pie. We're able to take nothing and make something out of it. So when did the complications start? When, so you said the first time you did it, it was like, oh, wow, this is a moment. When did, oh. the, when did the problem start? So, okay, so... um. I did my face first because I, because you know, it's the first thing people see when you walk out. I mean, we don't live in Saudi Arabia where you're covering your face. So, you know, here, here, it's the first thing people see. And so I said, I'll start with my face and then I'll work my way down. I'll do my breasts, I'll do my hips and my buttocks. So, um, I, the face was fine. Actually, I only had my face pumped twice. But then I was going to start working on my breasts. And I remember the day I went over and I, I only went to, um, to Duchess, to, Duchess. Um, you know, yeah, to the Duchess. I only went to her for my pumping. Um, so I remember her opening the door and I was going to start getting my breast pump. And she looked at me and she said, oh, no, bitch. Uh -uh. We got to work some more of that boy out of your face. Oh, no, she said, we got to beat that boy out of you. And I said, but no, I think I'm fine, Duchess. I think my face, no, no, no. I said, well, I don't have the money for my face today. I came from my breast. I don't care. I'm doing your face too. So she, girl, that day, she pumped my face. I think it took it over the top because she put a lot in that day. And um, that might have been the thing that, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it may have or may not. Who knows? But anyway, um, I had that third session on my face and she started my breast. And um, about a year and a half later is when all hell broke loose. My face just, just my, my face just like, it went haywire. I mean, I woke up one morning and like the whole side of my face was like a huge boil. And um, I knew something was wrong. I Because I, I, when I woke up, I felt my face and I walked over 
to the mirror and my heart started beating fast. And you know how that you get the butterflies in your stomach and my palms started sweating because I knew something was like going wrong. And I got, I, I got, I got really scared. And um, as the day went on, my face got worse. It got bigger and bigger and it was throbbing. And so that night I was like kind of pressing around in the mirror and all of a sudden my face exploded like into the, into the mirror, all this green, green stuff and blood and yellow stuff. It was a mixture of all uh, just gross. It came out. So I thought whatever was wrong was out of me now. Like I would be fine. Um, the doctors did say that the fact that it burst out of me was probably the thing that saved my life because if it had gone into my bloodstream, I could have gotten septic and died. So they were saying that that happening probably was, was a very good thing. Um, but after that, it was the beginning of like, oh my God, like these nodules that started to form all over my face. And my face became very, very disfigured. Um, and I say, honey, it's hard enough being a multiracial transgender woman of color. Try being that with a disfigured face. Because, you know, people, we live in a very visual world. You know, people are like judging you, you know, and looking at you and judging you based on your looks. And I pressed on, girl. You said that you went through a uh, depression where you kind of stayed in the house a lot and, you know, you didn't want to come out. Um, and so, you know, of course, that was a dark time and I want to go into that. But when did it start to shift and you started to, yeah. you know, say, fuck this and start living life again? What what got you to the point where, you know, I want to share my story and be in front of the camera and talk about this to people, to warn people or to, you know, show them a, a, a different way. Oh my God, even today, I'm still dealing with stuff because I get with the, what I call these outbreaks. So uh, I'll start, nodules will start to form and then I'll have to go to my doctor to get some injections to like calm it down. So I'm still dealing with health issues now, but, um, and even starting like pain, I'm getting pain in my hips and my buttocks a little bit. Um, and sometimes in my breast, but for the most part, stable. But to answer your question, um, okay, so I pressed on, but I think during that time I became very uh, agoraphobic because um, I love people and I'm very outgoing. But I think what happened to me is I became fearful of going out into public because I feared the reactions of people like how they were gonna react to me when they saw me. So I would literally like go to the same places all the time because I felt like at least I created a um, like a connection with the workers there. So it was like kind of like a safe zone for me. So I would go to the same gas station. I'd go to the same Dollar Tree, the same market, the same, you know, and I know, People have a habit of doing that, but like, I'll give you an example. One time I was like in Miami and I had to come back up here to Broward and my car was just about on E. Mind you, there was a gas station before I got on 995 and I was scared to go to that gas station. I was trying to make it up to the one that I always go to and ended up getting stranded on I-95, running out of gas. All right, so, so that's the extent of like the agoraphobia. I could have prevented that by just stopping at the gas station that before I got on I-95, but I was so hell-bent on having to go to this one gas station that in my mind, I thought was my safe zone, you know? And so that's how like, it gets mental, you know, and like it, it not only affects but is it, you. But is it more than mental? Because were, were people reacting in a negative way when they saw you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it was yeah, more yeah. than just your, it wasn't like it was in your imagination. No, it wasn't. People it wasn't. were just doing and saying shady ass shit because that's what motherfuckers do. Yeah, they were. And and they were, they were, they were quite mean. Um, 
it, but what I what it was is I think I was so paralyzed in my fear of that that it 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 made it difficult for me to maneuver in the world. I still did what I had to do. I went to the market. I went, you know, I did stuff, but it was like a challenge for me. And I remember like sometimes I'd pull up at a market and sit in my car, like to go grocery shopping. I'd sit in my car for like a half an hour trying to get the um, you know, the like the the courage up to go inside the market. So, um, but in all of that, I still did my activism. I think my activism was a place where I felt power. Let me, ask, like, let me ask you this yeah. before you get to that. What, how were you surviving and paying your bills during this time? I've always managed to, well, not always, but for the most part of my adult life, a lot of times I was able to get work. I think it's because of like my content of character and like the work experience that I already had. So I was working at a company at this time. Um, the company, like I was very unhappy there because people treated me horribly. I, um, you know, it's one thing for a company to say, oh, weeks, we're an equal opportunity employer. We'll hire you um, even though you're trans, like we're fine with it. But then when you get into the company and start working, you have to deal with like your coworkers. And like, I would say probably 80% of the workforce there at the company were against me. So it was so hard going to work because it's hard enough for the average person to get up and go to work every day. But then when you're getting up and going to work and you're working amongst people, your coworkers are like against you, it, it's even harder. And um, I sat at that job for six years, I did it. I proved myself because I moved up. And I think I even knocked down some walls for trans people that, that come behind me and work there. But for three of those years, I, I didn't have a bathroom that I could use. So I, I, I sat at my desk, like sometimes eight hours holding my pee, my, batter, my bladder about to bust because I couldn't use the bathroom. Um, they felt like I would be offensive to the women if I used the restroom. And that made me, I mean, you know, what that does to a person, like I'm sitting around all my coworkers who can just get up and go across the hall to the bathroom. Meanwhile, I can't use it. You know, like it, 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 it's, it, it just, it was really rough. And dehumanizing. Yeah very much so. But um, I, I, you know, I needed a job. Um, I was determined to prove myself. Um, I eventually did, um, I guess, I guess get the ability to finally be able to use a bathroom. But that was after some years there. And me making a little bit of a ruckus, you know, because, you know, after a while, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, and I've been here working just like everyone else. I'm entitled to that, you know? So anyway, um, you know what's so funny? When I watched that movie, um, oh, the movie. Um, figures. Yes. It reminds me of the situation I was in because there was one bathroom that they said I could use. The problem is it was, the building was like the size of like a football field. So I was on one side of the building and the bathroom that I could use, it was like a unisex bathroom in the personnel department was all the way on the other side. And it closed at four o'clock and my shift was from, well, I had like afternoon shifts and evening shifts. So a lot of the time I didn't have a bathroom to use and the time frames that I did, if I ever did go to use it, my supervisor would dock me because it took me longer to go to the bathroom because I had to walk that far. So it was just like, it was just a lot. It was a lot. That's what I was doing during that time. I was working at that company. And um, so I went to work. I was maneuvering through society, but like, you know, very, very paralyzed in my fear. And then, um, but still doing my activism. Like I would go and speak at different venues and share my story 
with different organizations here in South Florida. Um, I was working with them, but I think that's where I got my like um, fulfillment and my power and, you know, just felt like I was doing something in the world and, and making a difference, you know, because I believe we all are here for a divine reason, you know, reasons, plural, uh, and we all have a purpose. In 2011, my mom was down here on vacation visiting me, and we had the six o'clock news on, and she was making dinner, and I was sitting there, and we had the news on, and we were talking, and all of a sudden, Duchess came up on the screen, and they announced that she had been arrested because the whole time I wasn't able to get in contact with her after like everything happened because she changed her number and then she ended up leaving town and stuff. So I hadn't seen her in like, a, you know, since that time. And so um, I was like, oh, mom, that's the girl that did me. So she was like, what? And she um, came over and was like watching the story. And so at the end, the reporter said, if there's any other people out there that have been affected by her, you know, please give us, uh, I think they said, give us a call and they gave the number or they gave an email. It was one or the other. Um, so the story went off. So my mom looked at me and she says, well, are you going to, um, you know, to call the, the station? or contact the station. So I looked at her and I'm like, what's the use? I mean, you know, look, I'm in this situation. It is what it is. I'm not able to really get help in the sense of like fixing my face. And, you know, so my mom was like, are you sure? Like you, 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 you may want to think about that because so anyway, she let me alone. Um, and I prayed on it and meditated. And I was like, you know what? If I can share my story and use what happened to me to do good with it, like that's a great thing, like why not? So I emailed them that weekend. It was around Thanksgiving too. Thanksgiving 2011. And Thanksgiving was a Thursday. Um, that Friday's when we saw the news report. So Saturday, I thought about it. Sunday, I thought about it. Sunday afternoon, I emailed the station. So I emailed it and really like, I emailed them and I forgot about it. Monday morning, I'm waking up and my phone's ringing and it's saying um, CBS4. That's our local affiliate down here at the, the CBS uh, Channel 4. And um, I pick up and they ask for me and um, they start asking me questions. And before I know it, they're sending a crew to my house to do a story. And then that story aired on the 11 o'clock news that night. And I went to bed and girl, this is the, the reality of the world we live in today. Overnight, my story literally went worldwide um, viral. Oh, just overnight, because be, by 9 a.m. the next morning, CNN was calling my phone, Dr. Phil, Anderson Cooper, all the other local stations. It was like all this media, Germany TV, um, you know, a Spanish TV. It was like, you know, in the movies when they show a scene where all the news trucks show up or in front of the house, that's how it looked outside my window. So I was literally thrusted into the world media overnight. I shared my story um, with all that media. And then that then led to the talk show circuit. So I did like, you know, the doctors and the Trisha show like three times. And, um, and then that then led to reality TV with Botch. And that was the thing that really took it international. Um, because after I did Botch, I mean, it, it went from like a national thing to like me getting contacted from people like, that, you know, from all over, from, from um, South America and 
and Australia and Africa and India and Europe, you know, people just saying to me that, you know, they heard my story and they, they were really touched by it or they really in, were inspired by it and all types of people, like not just LGBTQ people. And that's the thing that's so amazing. Like, you know, beyond all the layers of what we are as human beings, when it comes to our core, we're all spirits of the universe living a human experience, you know? And so we're really all in this together, but it's amazing because um, one particular time I was in an airport flying out to LA to film and I was sitting in the terminal and this little white old lady, probably in her late seventies, she was pretty up there. She kind of like shuffles over to me and she says, you know, excuse me, sorry to um, disturb you, but I know who you are. And, you know, I saw your story and you're just such an inspiration to me. And in that moment, girl, I was like, oh my God, like this woman and I probably, our lives are world, worlds apart. Like we don't have probably anything really in common as far as like her being a white American, older woman, and me being a person of color here in America. I mean, so many differences, but there was a human connection that happened and there was something about my story that inspired her. And so that's when I was like, God, you know, this is not just a, a gay thing, a trans thing, you know, LGBTQ thing, a young thing, an old thing. It's, it's a, a, a human thing, you know, it's, a, it's that thing because, I think what it is, is people can relate to a story of like triumph, you know, from, or from like victim to victorious, like that strife and struggle, you going through the tunnel and getting to the other side and like that whole kind of thing. And I think that's just, you know, something that all humans can relate to. I remember early on um, in your, you you kind of going viral i have two friends who were disfigured by silicone and wow. one of them was by duchess and we were we were we we lived all of us lived in indiana and we had moved to houston at the time and uh, both of them were we're speaking about you in a way that um, that was like you were just so inspiring. Like you were you, wow. they they saw you. And even though it may not have inspired them to kind of come forward with their stories, they were in awe of you going through what you were going through um, and being open about it, being, you know, being even being vulnerable because, you know, we know, yeah, there's some opportunities that come from being viral, but also, you know, you're exposed to the vitriol of other people. So, you know, you got to deal with people coming in your comments and, you know, saying calling yeah. you monsters and, and oh, calling you God. this and just being so disrespectful and so insensitive. And shoot you got to build up a to thick shoot skin. Your, I got this all the time. You need to shoot yourself in the head and end it all kind of hate. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I, this is for me hearing my friends you know the power of your story through their eyes even though they may still be going through some things um but you just existing and being that person um that is kind of sometimes i don't sometimes i don't know what to say because i have a one of them i'm really really close to and one of them um i'm not um mm -hmm. But the one I'm really, really close to, as a as a girl who has been through the process of silicone, and um, and it and it worked out for me. Let's just say that. Yeah. Sometimes when I talk to her, it's almost like I can't get through to her because she was like, "You don't know what I'm going through because you don't have yeah. to walk through the world like I do." And, and even though I'm her friend and she, I'm the person that she can be the most vulnerable with because she can't be vulnerable with other people because I'm her friend, it, 
I don't know how to get to her. I don't know how to say, girl, you still got to live your life. You still got to go out here and make it and da, 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 da. And in, in the beginning, I didn't know how to do that for her. But you and your story was at least an example of courage. It was an example of, look, this is somebody who, even though this has happened to, she is not letting it stop her. She is actually yeah. going out here and, um, you know, still living her life. And she yeah. hasn't got to that point yet, but... I just, I, 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 I'm inspired by the fact that you are out here and you are the example of somebody who have gone through that and, you know, are, the you. courage to actually put it out there for us to see. Thank you. And, you know, and maybe, you know, everyone kind of evolves in their own time and maybe she will get to the, that point um, because of your friendship and also seeing, you know, people like myself that are like out and about and trying to still press on. Uh, but it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. And I did have moments where I felt like I wanted to give up and um, hide away, or I, I felt like I didn't like belong here on the planet. And like, I just, I had those feelings, but I know today, I mean, I can say it with full confidence. Each and every one of us are here for a purpose. We all have a reason and a season, and there's no one better than anyone else. From the queen of England to a homeless woman on the corner, every single life is precious. And I can say that with full confidence now, but there was a time where the world kind of made me feel like I didn't have a purpose and that I really didn't belong here, you know? Um, but I'm so thankful to God. I mean, I, I'm not religious, but I'm very spiritual. And I believe that my spirituality has been one of the things that have gotten me through. Um, I don't know if I would be here today if I didn't have that. Um, because, you know, when it's all said and done, girl, all of this, the clothes we wear, the jewelry we have, the house we live in, the car we drive in, you know, um, all of it, even our bodies we leave here when it's all said and done and we take our spirit with us. So, you know, that's like to the core where it's, where it's at. And, you know, I know it sounds cliche, you know, when people say, well, beauty's from within, but it really is because, you know, I remember when I was on Botch the first season, season two was my first season and they didn't do anything. They didn't do any procedures. They just featured me. And I got messages from people all around the world saying, but you're so beautiful. Oh my God, you are just a light. You're gorgeous. You're beautiful. And I said to myself, my God, you know, I'm sitting here with this disfigured face, but these people can still see my light. They can still see my love. They can still see the beauty. And that only was coming from within. That was only my spirit. It's time because people go through it. I mean, I'm sure your girlfriend has her moment, but, um, you know, thankfully she has you as a friend to encourage her. And I'm sure in your own, you know, unique and dynamic way, you give her strength um, because Besides my, ther my, my spirituality, I believe that the, the family members that have been in my corner, I do have family members that don't want to be bothered with me because I'm trans, but for the most part, a lot of my family, they are in my corner and, and my friends have been a great support too. You know, the friends that I do have. So um, it, takes, it takes all different things. I mean, I got into therapy. For a long time, I was just biting the bullet on my own. But therapy is very helpful. It really is. And I recommend it to anyone. You know, it's always nice to be able to have like an outside person, not like a, a friend per se. I mean, my therapist and I are friends. But what I mean is like someone that's like a third party that you can like talk to and bounce things off of, not like a close, close friend or family where there's like, you know, stuff that's 
there's a lot of stuff involved that you might not feel comfortable like pouring out certain things and expressing yourself. So I recommend therapy um, big, big time. And I just wanted to say, um, because I think you had, were trying to get on something about like the men and like the dating thing mm-hmm. and how that worked out for me. Because I, I remember you had said like, well, what did you do to live and survive? And I did work. I did that. But, you know, most girls, well, the younger generation, probably it's a mix there. But, you know, most of us older girls did, you know, <laughs> we Dab- I call it dabbling in the dark arts, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, I don't want to, I'm not like trying to make myself exclusive from that because, you know, I had my moments where I did that. And I always say, you know, it's how you treat something and you do do a particular thing. And I would, would always would say, honey, they're coming to Raji's temple and they're bringing their offerings uh, so that they can be blessed with the Raji liciousness. Blessed with the light, baby. <laughs> yes, with the light. But you know, it's funny. Even when my face was disfigured, I still had my boys, my dates that would come and see me. Um, you know, the men, because I became like a, a bit of a caricature, you know, because I would do my, ma- I would wear, you know, I always wear makeup. And so I was like, you know, I got pretty good with my makeup and trying to like work with the nodules and stuff. And um. And, you know, I do the, have my big hair and my outfits and stuff. So, you know, like I said, we make it work. We find a way to make it work. But I remember one time, this guy that I, that I was seeing quite regularly, we had finished doing our thing and he was getting dressed and he looked at me and he said, you know, being with you is like being with a sexy dragon. And I was sitting on the bed and I looked at him and I'm like, um... I don't know whether to kiss you or slap you. Is that a compliment? So so he was like, oh, no, baby. No, 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 it's a compliment. But what I'm trying to say is you look so exotic and different. It's like being with something that's like, I guess, out of this world. And so it's funny because um, I was telling one of my friends, she happened to be, she's Chinese. And um, she said to me, Oh, Raji, take it as a compliment because in Chinese culture, dragons are mystical and magical, right? So I was like, okay, I guess I'll take it as a compliment. But I told him to watch it, watch it because I mean, a sexy dragon. Okay. <laughs> Come on, dragon she- lady. Yeah. <laughs> The novelty. <laughs> but that's, you know, you know, that's just to, to share with you some of the dynamics with like me dealing with the men, you know, and mm-hmm. um and that sort of thing. Now I will say after my corrective surgery, I mean, you know, it got better because I, I had guys saying like when they would see me or like see pictures of me online, they'd be like, Oh my God, baby, um, you look so much better now. Like, like they would come out and say it. Um, and I've even had guys like that had that I used to deal with from years ago and they'll like contact me and they'll say, God, you look so beautiful now. So I know I probably won't ever be perfect, but I think I've come a long way compared to like, you know, the the way it was. So yeah. I love it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> You're welcome and many blessings to you, girl. You know what? I think that we're doing our our part, Fact. you know, because the bottom line is trans people are absolutely like unique, beautiful creatures. I mean, I think, you know, when they say, you know, like when people see us, sometimes it's like looking at a unicorn or, you know, unicorns are magical, um, you know, or it, 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 oh my God, or like a fairy or something out of this world. And, you know, uh, one of the things that like I kind of see us, you know, like my one of my favorite flowers is a um, a sunflower, and I think we trans people are like kind of like sunflowers because you know how sunflowers are like odd shaped and they're big and bright and like they stand out, and so you know we 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 trans people are beautiful, and I think that one day 
the world will hopefully see that. Um, it's happening already. And it depends on what, what culture you live in, but we and other people like us, we're helping that to happen. Well, Raji, I definitely see your light. I have always seen it. And I appreciate you sharing your story and having the courage to, you know, just let us see how you, what you have gone through and how you are persevering. And, you know, that light inspires me and I'm sure it inspires other people. And just thank you for being you. I appreciate you for Uh, taking the time to be with me. Thank you so much. I mean, I just, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be able to do this with you. Um, You know, I love when there's things that are trans led, um, you know, and I can see that you're doing your thing out there and you're touching a lot of people. I just wish you all the best, my sister. And, you know, this is a life's work, you know, and the good thing is when we're done here, we'll be able to go knowing that we made a difference and hopefully we made it better for trans people to come, the generations to come. I love you. I love you too. And that's a perfect note to end on. Make sure you tell them where they can find you. Oh, honey. Well, you know what? I am all over. (laughs) Now you can, well, of course you can Google me. If you put R-A-J-E-E Raji, I will probably pop up. So you can find me there. I'm on Instagram. Um, my Instagram is Raji underscore Botch TV. Um, and then, I, you know, I'm also on Facebook and YouTube. But, um, you know, hit me up on Instagram. You know, that would be great. I will put all of those links in the bottom. I want to thank y'all for listening. And make sure you follow Raji and you let us know how you enjoyed the conversation. We'll see y'all next week. Have a wonderful day. Love, peace, and blessings. You can listen to the rest of the show on all podcast platforms. Just search Marsha's Play. See you there.